So welcome to a brand new episode of CNB. I'm Siddharth Vinayak Patankar. Thank you for joining us. We are coming to you this week from Montenegro in Eastern Europe. It's a gorgeous location and with a gorgeous car, of course. Now, we used to live in a world where Jaguar was never going to do an SUV. We don't live in that world anymore because the car is here, it's ready to go and we've got all the different trims, the different engines, everything to take you through, all the details coming your way. Now, before I begin though, I want to quickly remind you of uh, very tall claim made by Jaguar that I spoke about at the New York Auto Show. This is going to be the highest selling Jaguar ever. Now that is quite a claim. So does the car have the goods to deliver on that? Let's find out. The Jaguar F-Pace is not a sedan on stilts, it isn't a plush little crossover and nor is it a soft roader. And yes, it is not a Land Rover dressed for the red carpet either. It's an SUV that puts the sport back in the sport utility vehicle. Jaguar was very sure it needed a crossover or SUV given the massive growth that the space has been seeing. In some ways, Jaguar is late to the party anyway. So it needed to have a car with enough on board to beat the Audi Q5, which had dominated the premium midsize SUV segment on most attributes like comfort, luxury, looks and equipment. And it also needed to best the BMW X3 in terms of drive dynamics. The Porsche Macan came after Jaguar had already done most of its work on the F-Pace and it moved the benchmark way ahead on performance and so Jaguar went after it as well. The F-Pace is a tad larger than the rivals and in a way it sits between them and their bigger siblings. Now let me get on with it. The F-Pace looks like a million bucks and was intentionally designed to look like a Jag. The car with me is the R-Sport trim in Italian racing red paint. When it comes to the styling on this car, you have to go back to the overall design direction that Jaguar is taking, something Ian Callum has shared with us on the program too. It's still, of course, a big revival story that we're witnessing with Jaguar. So it's an old brand, but because it's getting into new markets and it's starting to expand its product portfolio for the first time at this range, even when you talk about a brand new SUV and you could have gone in a new direction, um, Mr. Callum was very clear. It had to be a typical Jaguar, which is why you have the front grille and the headlamp, which is in line with the rest of the family. But then the good thing about this is that as you start to get into the bigger proportions on the SUV and you start to travel into the rest of that design, you see so much of the F-Type. And that's the best part. The rear fender merging its muscle into the F-Type signature tail lights. Very nice, isn't it? The former Yugoslav Republic of Montenegro offers stunning landscapes and more importantly, a varied mix of road types. The beauty of the F-Pace is that the moment you get in the car and start the engine, its sporting nature is immediately evident. Yes, on the base 2.0-litre diesel too. The car is agile and eager for action and the two key highlights for me are its suspension and its steering. Oh, let me add another. The brilliant 8-speed gearbox from ZF has been mated very well indeed to all three engines on the F-Pace. Many learnings from the Range Rover Sports development have been used here though. Torque, vectoring and chassis control top that list. The F-Pace feels a bit heavy on some uneven roads at higher speeds, but there is no perceptible body roll and the car really shines. Comfort is excellent, no matter which seat you're in. This is true off-road as well, to quite an impressive extent, but I'll come to that.
Now we come to the crazy bit of the drive. That car is poised at a 43 degree angle pointing down to the earth. It's my turn next. The ASPC system that Jaguar introduced on the XE does more than help manage slippery or brittle surfaces on the F pace. It also helps the car to negotiate tough terrain, climb and descend inclines, and I did use it a fair amount on this ramp constructed for us on the wall of a dam on Lake Slansko in southern Montenegro. All Surface Progress Control or ASPC, it's a system that doesn't just help you off-road, doesn't just help you to climb a hill, it also works uh, when it comes to the hill descent control. You don't need a separate hill descent control switch now on this car and uh, I'm about to put it to the test on this ramp that you've already had a glimpse of. It's quite an angle and here I go. I have to trust the system which means my feet go off the brakes, off the pedals, now. I could do that all day, it's just so much fun. And I did it a few times. Before I moved on to the water wading bit of the drive. And though I didn't go as deep as the claimed 525mm capability of the F-Pace, it was still fun to make a splash. The torque at hand and quick gear changes when needed make the drive a fun and pleasant experience. The 2.0-litre also does admirably well in cruising mode on the highway. If you push the pedal to the floor, you're instantly reminded it's a diesel. Otherwise, the engine is very refined and silent and cabin insulation is terrific. Now on to the bigger diesel, the 3.0-litre V6. Now the 2.0-litre diesel is the entry engine and uh, frankly it really delivers on that. It is fun to drive. It's obviously not the quickest off the block. It does about uh, 0 to 108.7 seconds, which is pretty good. But obviously, you know, cars like the Macan from Porsche are going to be faster and sportier. And then you've got this car. I've switched now to the 3.0-litre diesel. And uh, while of course it's a higher displacement engine, so you expect it to be more powerful and quicker, it's just a whole lot quicker and uh, it brings a smile to your face because it's also so smooth and so refined. It does 0 to 100, in case you're wondering, in 6.2 seconds. Now, of course, the petrol 3-litre does it even faster, but I'll drive that in just a little while from now. Let me enjoy this engine for now. Thank you very much. The Glacier White car I have switched to sports the portfolio trim with opulent interiors. The car with me also has an optional add-on black pack which means the side badging, alloys and rear spoiler besides bumper inserts are finished in a glossy piano black. So when we knew that Jaguar was going to do an SUV, there was always going to be this inherent fear that like a lot of other car brands, it's going to take its existing sedans and the cars that it knows well and then just bump it up. That's not the case with this car and I think that's something you get immediately the minute you start driving it. The good part though is that all the, the good bits from the new XE and the XF, well they've certainly been brought in and so that I think was a smart move. What it gives you is uh, some very clear areas that you can call USPs of this car and absolutely sharp steering, so precise and just so much fun with just the right amount of feedback. That's something I've thoroughly enjoyed and then the ride quality. You could have gone really too soft because you're trying to be a crossover and appeal to a wider audience. You could have gone really sporty and too hard because you're trying very hard to bring the Jaguar-ness to this car. Instead, what the Jaguar engineers have done is they found the right balance. The car isn't too soft, it isn't too hard, it's just spot on. The F-Pace has active dynamics which continuously measures body and wheel movement to offer best damper settings for the given conditions. You can also change the character of the car by switching it to dynamic mode and it also has a snow or wet mode for slippery conditions that allows for maximum traction. 
Configurable Dynamics allow you to individually adjust the throttle response, suspension, steering and gearbox. The smallest input onto the steering and the car just responds beautifully. It handles so well and it's just so nice coming out of a corner. I've just had a blast today driving this car, I have to tell you. After the underwhelming cabin on the XE with its questionable plastic quality, the F-Pace cabin impresses. You can get the optional 10.2-inch touchscreen that's superb. It has a tablet-like feel and it's well laid out with screens that you can toggle by swiping across them. It also allows you to expand maps to the full screen and has a pinch zoom function for the navigation that's really great and enhances convenience. The 12.3-inch virtual instrument cluster is also cool and lets you bring up navigation full screen there as well, just like in the new Audis. The digital dials are also customizable with four themes and the look goes totally red when you switch to dynamic mode. The F-Pace has 10 options for ambient lighting, but this too turns red when you switch to dynamic mode. There is no Apple CarPlay or Android Auto though, the 650-litre boot is 100 litres plus more generous than a Q5 or X3. Fold down the 40-20-40 seats and you get a massive 1740 litres. I'm switching again to the luxuriously sporty cabin on the S model. The Ammonite grey car also has the 3-litre supercharged petrol engine. Jaguar Land Rover says that India will initially get just the two diesels, but given the recent anti-diesel shift, it is now assessing the introduction of the petrol car to India too. For its part, the V6 petrol is a dream to drive, and that's not just because of its performance, but also its delicious soundtrack. The engine is a carryover from the F-Type, and it sounds like heaven when you put it into sport mode Screaming a nice angry note. I tried out the famous and crazy road to Kotor that has 25 hairpin bends down a steep mountainside, all in less than 20 kilometers. And I can tell you, the F pace did not disappoint. It exits corners near perfectly. The steering is so precise, and the car is happy to oblige when pushed hard. Once again, that wonderful little gem of a gearbox shines on the petrol V6 too. Now here on the off-roading track, I've got the ASPC or the All Surface Progress Control turned on. So it's like adaptive cruise control, except that it's not trying to judge a vehicle in front of you. It's actually judging the surface that's coming up in front of you and uh, the car pretty much takes over. So all I'm doing here right now is that I have the steering input and uh, I can set a speed here with the switches here on the steering wheel but otherwise the pedals I'm completely off them not the brake not the accelerator the car is pretty much deciding how it wants to do this and also deciding how much power to send to the rear or front wheels at any given time I've spent two busy and full days with the F-Pace, clocking over 400 kilometers in stunning Montenegro. The country's mixed road surfaces give me the confidence that the F-Pace will be very much at home in Indian conditions too. I've put the car through the paces and it has done well. The downside I fear is going to be pricing in India, which I reckon will be more than premium. But still, I can't wait for the India launch which should be just before Diwali. Large, handsome and masculine are words that we will not be using to describe the Honda Navi. A product developed by Honda Motorcycle and Scooter India is its boldest move ever. You saw it at the Expo, Honda's little offering both in price and dimensions. 
So let's see what does the little Navi have to offer for this big guy. A shrunken motorcycle was a general consensus when the Honda Navi was first unveiled, but it gets a lot of young elements that we've grown to like. The bike is based on the Activa and has similar dimensions to the popular scooter. The handlebar though sits taller and it's the only chrome bit on the bike. There are also a host of components that feel a bit too gimmicky like the fuel tank cover but it does the job of adding a sporty element to the styling. The bold headlamp stands out with a silver finished plastic cladding which brings out the motorcycle element on the moto scooter. The tail light seems to have come from the CBF stunner. What also works are the six vibrant color options on the Navi. While Honda did show some wacky customization options at the Expo, the ones currently on offer are quite subtle and come with interesting decals, interchangeable panels, crash guards, visor and an underbody guard, all of which costs an extra 6,000 rupees. Yes. The Honda Navi is small, but looks can be deceptive. What surprises is a tall rider like me is surprisingly comfortable on the Navi. The raised handlebars, the center set foot pegs make it a very fun bike, a very comfortable bike to average size adults can easily accommodate on the seat, which is, comes from the Activa again. The Navi uses the same 110cc single-cylinder air-cooled motor and is paired to a V-Matic automatic transmission from the Activa. It's a good 7 kilos lighter than the Activa as well, which allows a much improved power-to-weight ratio. While it rides well, the Navi feels unsettling, especially at high speeds. Larger bumps could be harsh for riders, as the front tends to lose balance easily. You sit upright and the raised handlebar fits right into place along with the center set foot pegs which are not retractable. Interestingly, tall riders will find the rear foot pegs accessible too, almost sports bike-like. The Navi borrows its front forks from the Activa 125 while the rear sports a single shock absorber similar to the Activa 110. Braking duties are handled by twin 130mm drum brakes and the combi braking system is given a miss. But there is enough grip on offer thanks to the 12-inch front and 10-inch at the rear. So would you call it a motorcycle or a scooter? While its looks may be motorcycle inclined, it is a flared Activa. But when you start comparing it with the entry-level motorcycles on offer today, the Navi loses out on novelty, charm and certainly the fun factor. But as a scooter, well, it is differentiated, quirky, fun and yes, it works. So nice twisty mountain roads, a whole lot of change in elevation, straight highways and of course some off-roading too. So nice way to put this car through the paces and we of course also brought all the different engine options for you because remember India will get the two diesels for starters and then after that we possibly should have the petrol coming in as well. React to this car, tell me how you like it, you know how to reach me and I'll see you on the program next week. We'll have plenty more for you. Until then, promise me you'll wear your seatbelts. Please wear your helmets if you are on a bike.